So thus far we've spent time discussing creating and managing indexes and we've shown you the benefits. We want to move on to focus on joins. Joins are a neat way of allowing us to practice good database management system techniques such as normalization which allows us to spread information into smaller tables effectively making use of normalization techniques and referencing that information using the smallest amount of information possible which r results in a reduction in redundancies throughout the database. So ideally as a DBA you want to normalize your data which means to spread unique pieces of data across as many tables as necessary and to avoid redundancies where, where possible or as necessary. To give you an example of where redundancy could creep into our small database structure let's take a look at the current structure. We'll show tables and we're working with an employees base table. We use two and three as copies and we set up salaries as a basic test. Let's describe employees and you'll see that we don't have all of the information necessary to keep track of pertinent important information for our employees. What are we missing as an example? Well notice the starting salary column is okay but what if we wanted to maintain just a basic salary column which references a lookup table rather than specifying salaries on a per user basis. To give you an example, let's select star from employees and you'll see for the one employee that we have in the table the salary is specified directly. But as we add employees to the table chances are likely that the value that you see here, $250,000, will be replicated causing it to be redundant. So rather than indicating a given salary or value multiple times within a table which promotes redundancies what we want to do is alter the table structure, the base table structure so that it references a lookup table which contains unique values. That leads us down using or the path of using joins where we store a very small value in a salary column and then have that value match a given row in a lookup table. Super. So how do we go about doing this? Well, we could add a new column to the existing base table employees or we could modify the existing base table but it would cause some corruption. So let's go ahead and extend the existing table. We'll eventually drop the starting underscore salary column but we're going to extend the employees table. So the first task is to extend it. So our task here is to reconfigure the HR DB to facilitate joins and promote fewer redundancies. Now inevitably you'll find that information is replicated or becomes redundant throughout your database. Information such as starting salary, perhaps even first name information, and other pieces of data are likely to be redundant. So wherever you find redundancies, split those redundancies off to separate tables, which we're going to do. So in order to facilitate this task, what we want to do is extend the employees table. So first task is to alter employees table to accommodate a field which will look up relevant data from remote table or from a separate table which is in effect what happens when we perform a join. So in order to do this we're going to execute an alter table employees and we'll add a new column. We can call it salary ID as an example or we can call it pay scale ID. Anything that works. Let's take a look at our table structure. We have a table called salaries. We're going to create an entirely new table that we'll look up. We'll call it pay scale because we're assuming in this example that there are certain salaries that are paid within our organization and 
that's it. So that our salary scale will be equivalent to the values that are stored in our pay scale table. So we're going to create a separate table to hold those values, and those values will be unique. So we'll alter table employees first, and we'll add a pay scale ID column. So we'll specify that column as pay underscore scale underscore ID. Then we'll define this column as an integer and you should match the same data type that's used in the lookup table so that when you perform the joins the values will match so both will use integers and if you make a change to the lookup table let's say going from integer to medium int or to big int then make the change to your lookup base table as well or the base table that relies upon the lookup table as well so that both types match and one doesn't outscale the other so it'll be integer and we don't want this particular column to contain any nulls so we'll specify not null and the reason is as follows any person that you're likely to enter into your employees table should have a salary even if it's at a consulting rate or a low rate there should be salary information at least within our requirements and within our company so let's alter this table to set up this new column and by default because it's not null my SQL will place the value zero into each record in our case we have only one record so only one record will be updated to reflect the value zero. Let's take a look. We've altered the table. One record has been updated. And we'll select star from employees again. You'll see that in the very last column, pay scale ID is set to zero for the loan employee. This is fine because we've yet to define the lookup table with its values. So task number two is we want to define pay scale lookup table so we need to create this table now let's suppose we have salaries in our organization or we pay salaries based on the following scale based on increments of fifteen thousand dollars beginning with thirty thousand dollars up to two hundred thousand dollars so let's say this is our pay scale anyone in our organization is likely to make somewhere between thirty thousand and two hundred thousand dollars based on fifteen thousand dollar increments so that's our scale now rather than inserting each of these values fifteen thirty forty five sixty and so on individually this is another use for the sequence command that's a built-in linux or a Linux command that ships with pretty much all distributions. If we execute sequence from the command line, so we'll say note use sequence command to output values. And we'll just include sequence in between single quotes. So if we use the sequence command with the following syntax, sequence will specify the beginning value or the lowest value, 30,000 followed by the increment 15,000 followed by the max value 200,000 and send these values into a file based on the name of the table that we've yet to create we should be able to import it using the MySQL import command so sequence 30,000 increment 15,000 and top salary 200,000 as long as it's a multiple of 15,000 we should have no problems otherwise sequence will cut off at the highest multiple below your max value so if you put a weird number let's say two hundred and three thousand the highest value you'll get is two hundred thousand so we'll send this into a file called pay underscore scale dot text because we will create a table based on the base name of pay scale dot text super so let's go ahead and execute this command from the shell and we'll do so first without redirection and then would redirection so that you see the output. Notice that the sequence command has outputted values 30 in increments of 15,000 all the way up to 195,000. Since 200,000 is not an exact multiple, notice it does exactly what we said, which is to give you the value right below. So 195,000, if we wanted to facilitate another value, we'd need to go one up from the existing value. So the next step would be 210,000. So if we went ahead and specified 210, for example, notice it takes you all the way up to 210,000 and that works out for us so we'll send this into an output file called pay underscore scale dot text 
and now the values are stored in pay underscore scale dot text and we are now free to define the table structure to house this information and then use MySQL import to import it so the next part of defining the pay scale lookup table after defining the source data is to use a create table statement we'll use create table pay underscore scale and we want an auto incrementing column which will function as the primary key in the index as a result it'll be integer and notice that the integer for this particular ID column matches integer for the column that we've just added, pay underscore scale underscore ID to the base employees table. So they're both integer. If you change one, change the other so that one doesn't outstrip the other. So it's integer and it should also be auto incremented. So we'll specify the keyword auto increment to instruct to the DB MS that it is to be auto incremented. And let's also define a column called salaries. This particular column will house the values from 30,000 through 210,000 and potentially higher values later on. We'll set a precision of 11, 2. And then we'll also indicate that this particular column should not be null. There should be a salary for every single row because users defined in the employees base table will look up values based on values in the pay underscore scale table. So one's dependent on the other. Or the pay scale underscore ID column is based entirely upon the values in rows defined in the pay underscore scale table. So we don't want null values. Additionally, we don't want duplicate data in our pay underscore scale table, the lookup table. So to avoid having duplicate data, what we'll do is set primary keys based on the ID column as well as the salaries column. When you set a primary key on a given column, that column cannot contain redundant or duplicate data throughout the entire table, regardless of the number of records in the table. You could have 10 billion records. They all must be unique. We want all of our salaries to be unique, and this will help us to normalize the table and to keep redundancies to a minimum. So auto-increment for ID, salaries, not null. And then we'll follow up with the keyword or the keywords or key term primary key. And in between parentheses, we'll specify ID, comma, salaries to indicate that both are to be treated as primary keys. And then we'll close with a close parentheses followed by a semicolon. And now we have our complete statement for creating the table in our vision. Let's go ahead and create that table from the MySQL terminal monitor. If there are any errors, we'll have to debug, which there generally are. And notice for the salaries, we didn't specify decimal. So let's go ahead and just modify that. So it's salaries decimal 11, 2. Now it's created, and we'll update our statement in our text file to reveal as such. So it's decimal 11, 2. Then return to the shell and execute a show tables where you'll see that the new tables or the new table that is pay underscore scale exists now we can drop salaries employees three and two because these were just for illustrating other concepts salaries for example allowed us to illustrate how to use indexes if you recall a show index from salaries will reveal indexes tied to this particular table and it's still defined so we can go ahead and just drop this particular table it's no longer necessary in fact it just confuses things now when we rerun the show index the index is gone because the table is gone by the way when you drop a table if you're wondering the actual index for that particular table salaries.myi is gone dropping a table removes its form file its table data file and its index file that's just something you should know. Let's go ahead and drop table employees 2 as well as employees 3. They're not necessary. Super. Now let's execute a show tables and we should have two tables. This makes it much, much easier to work with. The employees base table contains as little redundant information as possible, including the user's name, date of birth, start date, as well as a starting salary which we may or may not keep as well as a salary ID lookup column or a pay scale pay underscore scale underscore ID column which will look up values in pay underscore scale if we describe pay underscore scale you'll see 
that it currently has two columns ID auto incrementing based on integer and salaries and as you can see nulls are not accepted in either and they both must be unique super now if we were to show indexes from pay underscore scale you'll see that their index is based on two columns we did mention that we can lump up to sixteen columns into an index based on a my ism or my isam that is storage engine table which is the default so this is only two out of sixteen or two sixteenths or one eighth so we still have a ways to go before exhausting the index capabilities so now that 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 said what we need to do is import the data into the salaries column so next what we're gonna do is actually import the salaries that we've stored in the pay underscore scale dot text file into the pay underscore scale table no differently than we've done before with mysql import although we're gonna slightly vary the command so that the data is inserted into the proper column once it's in the column then we will ensure that we update the various columns for the employees and certain new employees and perform our joins and then move on to the different types of joins that are possible with MySQL. So let's continue with our discussion of joins. So we're ready to import the pay underscore scale dot text file into the pay underscore scale table. In order to do so, we'll run MySQL import from the shell. So the next step in our task, which is based on the joins that we're going to be looking at, is to import pay underscore scale dot text into pay underscore scale table using, of course, MySQL import. We've been using MySQL import instead of load data because MySQL import performs a load data and is considered the standard way for importing data from external sources, especially flat files such as text, tab, comma, separated, and so on files. So we're going to focus on MySQL import. That's the way the developers of MySQL are heading in terms of importing external data sources, based primarily, of course, on flat files. So in order to import this file, we're going to execute a MySQL import. We'll prompt, of course, for the password, which we'll specify on the command line. But the new option that we wanted to introduce is the dash C option. The dash C option will allow us to indicate to MySQL import the column that MySQL import is to insert into. So if you notice, let's go to the shell. If we were to cat pay underscore scale dot text, you'll see that this file contains one column. However, the pay underscore table contains two columns. Let's describe it again, pay underscore scale, and you'll see that it contains two columns. So in order to instruct MySQL import, we use the dash C option, which clearly tells it to use a given column name. Otherwise, it defaults to the first column logically, which is the ID column. So we'll specify dash C followed by the name of the column, which is called salaries. If there are multiple columns that you're importing data into, specify them in the logical order using a comma separator. So for example, let's say we had salaries in another column called year, and our external flat file contained the salaries in one column, tab separated or comma separated by another value indicating year. Then you'd simply from the command line specify MySQL import salaries comma year comma the next and so on so this is how you'd specify the columns in the proper order that MySQL is to in interpret the columns from the flat file it reads it from left to right and that should be pretty obvious so it reads the very first column as column number one which should equate to salaries to right so MySQL import password the column that we're dealing with is called salaries and we should specify the name of the table that MySQL import should operate on. The table name is pay underscore scale. And we'll follow that up with the name of the text file, pay underscore scale dot text. This is enough to import the various values from the text file into the DB.
Now, if you recall, when we defined this particular table, we indicated that it's to be unique, both columns, ID and salaries, which means if we inadvertently attempted to insert the same text file twice, the DBMS would not permit it. And we'll show you that momentarily. Again, they're both primary keys, which means that all of the values stored in the salaries lookup table should be unique, which promotes normalization, which reduces redundancies and increases efficiencies in the DBMS's routines, including lookups, queries, results, data retrieval, and so forth. So let's move forward with running that MySQL import command to import payscale.txt. Now we don't need to be in the HR directory, but we know or we, we realize that MySQL import will attempt to import the file from the database directory beneath varlive MySQL. Let's execute it and we'll watch all of the values import into it and we have an error in this particular setup. Let's just double check what that is. Unknown database pay scale. Let's check that out. Oh, in the database we have wrong. It's actually HR so we need to correct that. It's the HR database pay scale table which is extracted from the name of the text file. So MySQL import as we've mentioned uses the base name of the text file to match the table. Let's try it again and it'll work and before examining the results let's just update our text file to indicate that the name of the DB not table is HR in this case. Now let's examine the results. 13 records were imported into the pay underscore scale table. That should reflect exactly what or the number of records in the pay underscore scale dot text file. It's wc dash l against pay underscore scale dot text and you'll see that it contains 13 rows. We could cat it and you'll see what those 13 rows are and similarly from the DBMS we can now execute a select either count and or count from the table. Let's execute it against pay underscore scale followed by and and we didn't specify from again let's go ahead followed by a select star from pay underscore scale and you should see the exact same data in the exact same order as specified in the text file from 30,000 through 210,000. Now we did mention that because both columns ID and salaries are considered primary keys they will not accept redundant data which means if we attempt to import the same text file again MySQL import will echo the error returned by the MySQL DBMS. Let's try that again. Here's the import function. And notice, 13 records, but let's confirm what has occurred in a database. Notice in our case, it's, it actually imported the data twice, causing 26 records, which indicates a problem that we want to show you how to rectify so that this exact problem doesn't happen in your environment because quite likely the user who imports the data may do it twice, may do it n number of times greater than one, causing redundancies in a table that you aim to not be redundant. Now to fix this problem is quite simple. All we need to do is run an alter st table statement using the unique keyword and that will ensure that this particular column will accept unique values. So the point that we'd like to drive home is that by simply defining a column as a primary key is not enough. We also need to use the unique keyword. For the ID column it's okay because this particular field is auto incremented. The values are generated by the DBMS. But for a column such as salaries where we insert the data we must specify unique. So let's go ahead and run that alter table statement. And again, we could just simply drop this particular table and recreate it using unique or use alter table. So an alter table against the pay underscore table and we'll execute the modify keyword to modify salary and salary will be of its existing type which is decimal 11 comma 2 but we'll also include a keyword of unique to indicate to the DBMS that it's to be treated this way. And let's double check that. And it should be salaries plural. Let's fix that command. And now it's been updated. Now you notice an error is returned 
indicating that there's a duplicate entry for 30,000. This was the first duplicate found at row number 14. Let's take a look at the table. No data has been dumped, but if we attempted this time to insert the data again using MySQL import, and we return to the shell, to the MySQL terminal monitor, you'll see that it continues to accept the duplicates. What does this tell us? This tells us that the alter table statement wasn't applied that we ran because the data or the table contains duplicate data. So MySQL performs those checks for you. And let's show you that again. If we try to alter it, it doesn't work. Duplicate entry, it found it, and it can't apply a unique constraint if the values are truly not unique. So the best way to rectify this particular problem is to delete everything from the table and then recreate it, or to drop the table altogether and redefine it. So a drop table, pay underscore scale, will rectify this situation. Then we need to recreate the table, and we have our command waiting for us. But this time we're going to specify unique for the salaries. In addition to not null, we want the column to be unique. So we just want to point that out. It's a common mistake, not just with MySQL, but with DBMSs in general, where the DBA sees redundancies but doesn't see them in time, and it can cause data corruption as a result. So you've got to be very careful. Let's now describe pay underscore scale again. It should be empty when we run a select against it. Select star from pay underscore scale reveals that it's empty. And now let's attempt to import twice. There's the first import, 13 records were imported, and here's the select indicating the 13 records. Let's try to import again, and now MySQL import fails as it should. So the bottom line is, for columns that need to con contain unique values, use the unique keyword. And we want to go through this long-winded approach because this, this commonly trips up even seasoned DBAs when using a DBA that they're not terribly familiar with. So now our DB will not accept duplicate values, which means from the shell, if we were to create a new pay underscore scale file and take it up another level, so we'll use sequence beginning at 225,000, which is the next increment, with a stepping of 15,000 and a maximum value of, let's say, 300,000 into the pay underscore scale dot text file. This will create new entries in pay underscore scale dot text, which we can update. Let's tr check that again. Oh, we went to 30,000, causing a decrement instead. Let's try that again. And now let's cat it. Now it has 225 up to 300,000. Let's attempt to import these unique values into the DB. Since the last value, number 13, is at 210,000, we should have no problems importing this whatsoever. So let's try it. Super. Six records were inserted. The exit status reveals that it was good. And now a select star from pay scale reveals values 14 through 19 were inserted. Now we don't have a constraint on the salaries column to, to ensure that only values in increments of 15,000 are applied, although that's certainly possible. But rather, we'll, we'll perform that work outside of MySQL using the sequence command. And we'll ensure consistency in the increment stepping. But whatever the case is, we have values now from 30,000 through 300,000 based on an increment of 15,000. These values are unique, and we can now perform the joins to look up the data from the employees table. So rather than storing these values in the employees data, just think about it. Let's select star from employees, and you'll see that for one employee, it's OK. They may have 250,000, but if you add another employee with the same salary, 250,000, then it doesn't make much sense. Whereas we could just look that information up from a table. So instead of storing 25 followed by the number of zeros necessary, four zeros, many times for all of the users, for n number of users, we simply store the integer value in the user's pay scale underscore ID column. And then that makes it much easier. Now, this particular employee makes 250,000, which is a value that does not exist in the table. We could insert it manually by using an insert. Let's say we have a few users who are outside of the $15,000 increment. So we'll insert into pay underscore scale, and we'll set 
salaries equivalent to 250,000. And this should insert it directly. Now let's reselect star from the wrong table from pay scale. And you'll see that 250,000 has been appended as value number 20. This could be reorganized, but nonetheless, this makes room for us to insert 20 into the user's base table for employees, for the particular user's base table information. So for this employee, we can specify a pay scale ID of 20. So we'll do so using an update statement. We'll update employees setting pay underscore scale underscore ID, which is our lookup column, equivalent to 20, where name, but in this case we have only one record, so we don't need criteria, but we'll specify it anyway, where name is equivalent to single quote followed by the user's or employee's first name. And let's just specify it's actually F name and we'll rerun a select to in indicate what's there and notice for pay underscore scale ID this particular employee has a value of 20 which means we are free to get rid of the column starting underscore salary and rely solely upon the lookup from pay underscore scale underscore ID in order to get rid of the starting underscore salary column, we'll need to use yet another alter statement. So let's put as another task, or a step four in this overall task, to remove salary or starting underscore salary column. And as you know, to do this, we use the alter table statement using alter table, and we'll drop and that particular column's name which is optional the keyword column is optional is called starting underscore salary which will cause data corruption data corruption is de defined loosely and in this case is defined as simply clobbering the value two hundred and fifty thousand dollars let's execute that alter table statement and check our error and as usual we admitted a small but important piece of information and that's the name of the table so we're altering table employees and we're gonna drop column starting salary it's been dropped and let's rerun our select to ensure that it no longer exists and notice for the user Tricia all information is preserved with the exception of the starting underscore salary column but we've replaced starting underscore salary with pay underscore scale underscore ID being a lookup or an ID 20 which matches ID 20 from the pay underscore scale table. A select star from pay underscore scale returns all possible values for salaries. However, if we add a clause which says where ID is equivalent to 20, it returns only the row which contains $250,000 and more specifically we don't want ID we just want to return salaries so let's return salaries by selecting only salaries and now we have 250,000 and we're en route to performing the join which means that going forward when we want to return information from both tables we're gonna to have to query both in the same select statement joining both tables or the row information based on the ID so 20 will be equivalent to 20 and that'll be our first join so next we're gonna perform the joins and then construct other types of joins that are supported by MySQL let's go ahead and show you the different types of joins that are possible within MySQL as mentioned, MySQL supports the International SQL Standard. That standard is SQL 2003, or the most current release of the standard. So any documentation that you can obtain related to SQL 2003 will assist you in writing queries and managing the MySQL DBMS. But a lot of the joins that are permitted in 2003 SQL spec are also permitted in MySQL and MySQL extends some of the different types of joins. Before getting into what those differences are, let's discuss some basic joins. You know that we have data in separate tables. 
we have a base table that we refer to as employees. Let's show tables. And we have a pay scale table which consists of various salaries that our employees are likely to earn. And we want to be able to join information from one table with information from another table. The most basic type of join that you can execute or design and run or execute within MySQL is called a table reference join. A table reference join usually is defined as an equijoin or a join where you use the equal operator to define the join to the DBMS engine. So we're looking at equijoins which rely, so we'll say equijoins rely upon table references. In fact, all joins rely upon table references and there's a distinct syntax that needs to be used when defining a join. But the most common type of join that you're likely to employ is called an equijoin. An equijoin relies upon the equal operator. So equijoins rely upon table references and the equal operator. Let's write an example of an equijoin. We know what our data set looks like. Employees base table salaries lookup table. So the basic equijoin that we can execute looks like the following. We'll select star and we're able to select star because if you notice there are no overlapping columns. If we describe employees it consists of the following columns and if we describe pay underscore scale it consists of a different set of columns with the exception of ID. But we're not going to select ID from pay underscore scale. We're simply going to join based on ID. So if we were to execute a select star to perform a join, every column from the first table will be returned if the join is met. We could optionally return just a specific column using select statements, such as select first name, last name from the base table, where pay scale ID is equivalent to pay underscore scale dot ID. So a join requires the following. Select columns. In this case, let's go with F name, comma L name. And it also requires, after we specify salaries here, we need to specify salaries which comes from the pay underscore scale table which is not duplicated as a column name or a field name with an employee so we don't have to fully justify the name. So we'll select the column list that we're interested in from the table references. Table references can be specified using a comma delimiter. We'll begin by specifying the base table employees comma the lookup table pay underscore scale. So we're selecting three columns from two tables. But because there are no overlaps with the exception of the ID column, which we're not selecting but using for a join, then we don't need to fully qualify the column names. But we'll show you how to fully qualify these names momentarily. So we'll take three columns from table employees and pay scale. Two from employees, one from pay underscore scale, of course, obviously, the column which contains the salaries, which is labeled as salaries. Once we've gotten out of the way the columns that we want and the tables that we want the database engine to focus on, we then need to define a WHERE clause followed by its criteria which normally includes an equal operator rendering this particular join an equijoin. So we need to set a criteria. The only criteria that we can set that would make any sense is to take a column from one table, pay underscore scale ID, that matches a column from the lookup table which is simply called ID. There's no requirement for the columns to be called the same thing. They can be called whatever they want to be or whatever you want them to be. But What's important is that when MySQL performs an equijoin it finds a matching value in the first column or in the first table that is in the pay underscore scale underscore ID column that matches one of the values in the pay underscore scale table. In this case it'll match the ID column. And because we've taken care of uniqueness, we don't have to worry about the lone employee, Tricia, accidentally matching multiple salaries because the salaries column is a unique column within the pay underscore scale table. So we'll select these columns from these tables where 
in this case pay underscore scale underscore ID is equivalent to simply ID but there are two ID columns so we should qualify these particular columns by justifying them the way you justify columns is to specify the name of the table then the name of the column so we could say where employees dot pay scale underscore ID is equivalent to pay underscore scale dot ID this fully qualifies the column names to perform the join on and this is enough of a criteria for us to perform the join so let's recap what we've done here we're selecting three columns from two separate tables but part of the requirement in defining defining a join whether it's an equi join natural join or any type of join is that we have a criteria defined and we usually define criteria using the where keyword the where clause helps us to define criteria and we're using an equi join because or we know that we're using an equi join because we're using the equal operator so let's go ahead and execute this query and see what's returned of course we'll need a semicolon at the end of a statement but what should return are the three columns that we selected. Let's look at this again. First name is returned as F name. L name is returned as L name with, of course, the appropriate value. And salaries is returned from the pay underscore scale table. And as you can see, the salary is correct. We know it's correct because if we were to select F name, underscore, comma, that is, L name, comma, pay underscore scale underscore ID from employees which is the base table you'll see that this particular users pay scale ID is 20 now let's select ID comma salaries from pay underscore scale where salaries is equal to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars you'll see that the ID column is also 20 so the join is matching pay scale ID to ID from the, the lookup table or the secondary table so that's a simple equi join we can do so using the equal operator and that's one way to create a join yet another way is to qualify everything that's specified in the join so let's replicate this query but this time qualifying everything that's selected and you'll see that it works similarly so rather than being rather vague or relying upon a DBMS to resolve the uniqueness of columns, let's qualify everything. Instead of simply F name, we'll specify employees dot F name and we'll copy the employees dot prefix and place it in front of L name as well. Salaries, however, comes from a different column or from a different table. So it's a different column in a different table. And that table's name is pay underscore scale dot salaries. And everything else is justified. The from remains the same, but the criteria that's used to carry out the equijoin is already fully justified. So it's fully qualified. Let's run this query as is with everything fully justified and see the results return again of course we'll terminate with a semicolon and notice that everything comes out nicely the only problem when using a fully qualified join is that the length of your query can easily become pretty large and exceed your screen so for that we have what are called aliases which we've shown you we can select tables and define them as aliases and then make references to those aliases so let's show you how that's done. So we want to use aliases in joins, in joins to conserve monitor real estate. Even if you have a pretty large screen, it still helps to know that this is possible. We'll run the same query. We want to select, but this time we're going to prefix each column from each table with a unique name. Since we're performing a join based on two tables, and by the way, you can perform a join on many tables, but we're doing only with two, you can prefix each of the two tables with two indicators, such as T1 and T2, which represent tables one and two, at least within our framework. So let's select T1, but we haven't set up the alias yet. This is only a portion of setting up the or a portion of the requirement of setting up an alias. So we'll select T1.fName 
followed by t1.lname for last name, followed by t2 from table 2.salaries from employees, and this is where we set up the alias, employees as t1 or base table as t1. This is just an alias, followed by pay underscore scale as t2. And then we carry out the remainder of the criteria, but this time using the newly created aliases, where t1 dot pay underscore scale underscore ID is equivalent to t2 dot ID. Now it doesn't seem like we've saved much, but if you selected additional columns, you'll see it saves and it makes the reference much easier. So let's try this out. This time we've included the semicolon and we'll return to the shell and execute this. You'll see that the results are identical. So we can set up aliases for the table names pretty easily as well as for the column names if we want. That works out pretty well as well. For example, you could select t1.fname as, let's say, first name. This certainly would work just as we've shown you how to use or construct aliases. Then the column is returned as first space name with no changes to the underlying table structure. And ditto for the next column. We'll set this up as last space name. And this may assist you in formatting output that is to be imported into a spreadsheet, for example, or even a, another database. And perhaps we want to do the same for salaries. Instead of calling it salaries plural, let's call it current salary and we'll try this again and you'll see that MySQL in true SQL 2003 fashion sets up the aliases properly. Let's double check that t2.salaries as and we didn't include single quotes or back ticks so the DBMS engine interpreted the query improperly. Let's attempt to do that again Excellent. So first name, last name, current salary, and all of which can be dumped to an out file for import elsewhere, all without touching the base table column definitions. But there's an even easier way to set up aliases. We can take the same query that we've defined thus far and remove all of the as statements. So in a separate window, let's paste the query, and we will just simply replace as with nothing and this will just get rid of anywhere that we specify as and we'll double check that we haven't clobbered any of our column or table names so we'll select t1f name as first name and we can just get rid of that extra space t1l name as simply last and got rid of the as from here last name t2 salaries current salary from employees this will work from employees and Let's double check that. And let's copy this string over to our original document just to be sure before we run it. Notice it got rid of some additional information. So from employees, and employees can be T1. Employees T1, that works out fine. Pay scale T2, get rid of the space, where T1 dot pay scale ID is equal to T2 dot ID. This should work. Let's go ahead and run it. And we have an extra T, hr.employees. This is inadvertently placed. Let's try that again. And it ran just the same. So we can construct aliases without using the as keyword just by simply specifying the name that the table is to be aliased as or the column is to be aliased as. We can alias tables, we can alias columns, all while performing our joins. So what we focus on thus far are equijoins. Equijoins rely upon the equal operator to match columns that are in common between the two tables. The columns need not have the same name. Again, a describe of employees reveals that its column that it has in co common with the pay underscore scale table is called pay underscore scale underscore ID. But if we describe pay underscore scale, you'll see that its in common column is called simply ID. But they're both of type integer and the base table has one record which has a record in this particular table. 
Now you may be wondering, what if the one record or the lone record or some record in the base employees table doesn't have a matching column, then the join is not performed. For example, let's select F name, comma L name, comma pay underscore scale underscore ID from employees. And you'll see that the current user has an ID of 20. If we ran an update statement against this particular table, so let's go ahead and update employees setting and we don't need to set a crit or specify a criteria because there's only one record so we'll set pay underscore scale underscore ID equivalent to 9000 which doesn't exist in our lookup table and then rerun the select you'll see that the user now has a pay scale with an ID of 9000 which doesn't exist let's select star from pay underscore scale you'll see that in the ID column you're pressed to find a value of 9000. Now let's attempt to perform the join again. This time will fail however because there isn't a matching in common column. Let's run that select and notice the result set is empty and that's because the DBMS engine was unable to perform the equi join. It found payscale ID for the user, but it couldn't find a matching payscale ID in the payscale table or pay underscore scale table. So these are equi joins. Joins can be performed using pretty much any operator, including equal and the other symbols. Let's just list that. Note, joins can be performed using any operator, such as and in between single quotes we'll define them as equal, less than, greater than, less than or equal to, obviously greater than or equal to, as well as not equal to, which can be specified in a couple ways, and even using like. You can even use like to perform joins based on data that's similar, but this is less common. The most common type of join that you're likely to find is based on the equijoin or the equal operator because you're looking for specific hits rather than things that are similar. But if you're performing analysis, however, you may want to use like or one of the less than or greater than symbols to find plus or minus values or things that are similar or not similar. Super. So those are equijoins. Now there are other types of joins that we want to look at next. Thus far, we've considered equijoins. We've discussed the fact that equijoins are based on the equal operator, and they're going to likely be the most common type of join that you execute throughout your SQL, MySQL, or in general structured query language career. But there are other types of joins. Another type of join that we'd like to briefly discuss and show you is called a natural join. Natural joins are supported by MySQL, of course. Otherwise, naturally, we wouldn't talk about them. Natural joins are like inner slash equi joins, which we just described, in that natural joins wear a similar syntax to your typical equi join, but the difference is that natural joins will return columns from one particular table that happens to have overlapping columns with another table, such as the ID column that we identified. Let's take a brief look at our table structure. We'll show tables to further elaborate. Let's describe employees. We'll use tab completion. Employees contains an ID field, and so does the pay underscore scale table. Let's describe it briefly, and you'll see momentarily that it also contains an ID column. In a natural join, we continue to join values from one table to another and base those joins on returning all rows from one table, the base table, but performing only the join necessary to extract one or more columns from the second or lookup table. So in other words, it's very similar to the inner join that we just performed, the equi join, but it naturally selects the overlapping column from the table on the left or the left specified table. Before doing so, let's run an update statement so that the user Trisha Hyacinth has a pay scale 
ID of 20. So let's update employees and set pay underscore scale underscore ID equivalent. In fact, let's increase the salary. We'll set it to 100, whatever 100 is. A select star from, in fact, let's just get pay scale underscore ID from employees will reveal that the pay scale is now 100. We've yet to resolve 100, but we will momentarily. Whatever it is, it should be higher than the 250,000 at pay scale 20. Having said all of that, let's ensure that there's a 100 in the salaries table or in the pay scale table, the salaries column, which we don't think there is. We'll select star from pay underscore scale and as you can see it only goes up to 20 so let's adjust this pay scale from 100 which is a bad value to 19 which we know is a legitimate value and that represents 300,000 so back to this whole idea of natural joins let's write a natural join it's going to mimic a typical join so it'll be a select the columns that we're interested in but let's take all columns from the employees base table including the overlapping ID column by specifying employees dot star this selects all columns from the employees table optionally we could specify simply the columns that we're interested in such as ID comma F name comma L name and whatever else either or will work let's go with employees dot star now we can alias this particular selection by using the as alias indicator or simply by specifying the alias without the as keyword right next to the selection that's made so we'll alias employees dot star is simply uppercase e comma salaries which will be retrieved from the pay underscore scale table from employees which is the main table and as you can see the table is not yet alias so as we we specified employees dot star as e we could also specify star or select the columns that we want including salaries from the secondary table and then alias it after the fact for example we would alter the syntax to say select uppercase e dot star without aliasing here followed by salaries from employees e followed by sal pay underscore scale where the salaries column exists so now that we've gotten that out of the way we want to ensure that we perform the join as necessary now we could go with a left join here which is similar to an inner join or just perform this the typical criteria using the where clause either or will work if we go ahead and say where e dot pay scale ID is equivalent to pay scale and we should also set up an alias for pay scale so let's go ahead and just make this P so that we can abbreviate it across the board so P dot ID and that's our query so E dot pay scale ID is equivalent to P dot ID and this is a natural query simply because both tables contain an ID column but MySQL's natural join interpreter realizes that we really want just the ID column from one table and not from both. Let's take a look at the output and you'll see that ID has been returned. Trisha's ID is 1. But we didn't return ID from the pay underscore scale table, but we did get the salary at level 19, 300,000. Let's alter this natural join to select fewer columns from the employees base table. So we'll go with E dot F name and just since we know we can and it's a natural query let's go with E dot ID as well followed by E dot first name then E dot L name and we'll continue selecting the remainder. Now we only retrieve we've only retrieved the columns that we're interested in. Again ID appears in both tables but because it's a natural join MySQL knows the difference so you can perform natural joins in one of two ways by selecting the 
table on the left followed by all of its columns or select columns from the table on the left or on the right either or MySQL will naturally perform a natural join returning the ID column only from one of the two tables or one of the n number of tables in the event that you're joining more than one table now we did mention you can perform a left join let's show you the syntax for left join a left join is another common join and by the way the joins that we've shown you thus far including the normal where clause is are considered inner joins and there is a syntax inner join which can be used but either or will work you can use the where clause or inner join but the syntax slightly varies but performs the same functionality the same task and returns the same output to left join this particular information we will select the columns that we're interested in let's go with ID F name L name and salaries from employees and we can set this up with an alias such as E and then we'll left join and in between parentheses we'll specify the table that we're going to left join on employees in that case it happens to be the pay underscore scale table we're gonna left join pay scale on and another set of parentheses and in between those parentheses we will specify the columns that are to match in this case those columns include e dot pay underscore scale dot id is equivalent to pay scale we could have alias this as well in the first set of parentheses but since we've already gotten this far pay scale dot id and this also shows that we can mix and match aliasing as we see fit so you can feel free to alias the tables or columns that you want to at any time you don't have to alias them all there isn't a blanket statement or a policy that forces you to alias everything so we'll select ID first name L name salaries from employees and employees will be aliased as simply E then we'll left join pay scale left join means to join on the left table or the left most specified table in this case that happens to be the employees table there's also a right join and there are also outer joins that are the opposite of inner joins let's kill this particular command and we'll reconnect using HR and then rerun our query let's double check that we don't have the full thing copied and it says column ID and field list is ambiguous here a natural join isn't being performed so we could go with E dot ID to clarify and same thing for the remainder so we have E dot F name as well as E dot L name since it comes from those particular tables and then the salaries column comes from pay underscore scale and this will be joined on e pay scale id is equal to pay scale id and it's we have messed up the syntax a little bit this will be e dot last name pay scale dot salaries instead I notice it's saying it doesn't know e dot pay scale id in this section so the alias isn't actually making it over the e dot pay underscore scale underscore id so we screwed up the syntax so let's clarify we'll copy this and compare and contrast to what we wrote again a lot of debugging occurs when you write queries so in comparison we are selecting e dot id e dot f name e dot l name so we're being clear here we're qualifying our columns followed by pay scale dot salaries which we could have also aliased when we selected here so pay scale could simply be pay scale as uppercase P and then you, you change wherever you reference pay scale to be simply P dot salaries and P dot ID for example this would work as well let's paste that in and debug whatever errors come up but none so it came out cleanly so we've returned the ID, the F name, the last name, and the salaries using a left join. Left join indicating that the pay scale table, which was selected second, so it's on the right, is to join its ID column on employees.pay underscore scale underscore ID. Now again, you could go off and create other lookup tables. Another example would be for a table called dependents. Let's say 
some of the employees, perhaps the female employees or male employees, depending on how dependents are defined, within the organization are, need to be tracked independent of the base table. You could then create a table called dependents. So let's take a look at how that would work. So our new task is to create a lookup table to house distinct employee dependents. So this is our new task. Let's go ahead and define the structure. Of course, we can always use alter at some point in the future if we feel that we are missing key columns for storing information related to dependents. So let's go ahead and create table. And we'll create table as employee underscore dependents. We'll define the structure in between the parentheses, leaving some space, of course. Let's define an employee ID. This employee ID will not be auto-incremented. It will be inserted by a front-end application or the DBA or someone using the MySQL interface. And the values here will directly correlate to one or more users in the employee's base table. So we'll set employee ID to be an integer. Again, this particular column will match a given user's employee ID, which we're simply defining as the auto-incremented ID that MySQL generates for us. For example, the user Trisha has ID 1. That'll correlate directly to the employee ID in this new table called employee dependence. So employee ID integer, we don't want it to be null. And we should define, perhaps, an F name as varcar. 20 for the dependent, followed by a last name being also varcar20, followed by middle name being varcar20, and last but not least, let's specify a social security number. We'll set that to car9. So we'll simply call it SSN car9 since it's nine digits in length. So now we have a table structure once we execute this that will store employee dependence and function as a lookup table, but we'll need to insert data into it and then perform joins. This is a great way of offloading small bits of information that's related but doesn't need to be in the base table. We'll give you a clear example shortly as to why this information should be stored in a separate table. Let's just first go ahead and create this new table. So now we have a new table. Let's execute show tables. We have a base table of employees, but employees also have dependents. And employees also ha are listed at various pay scales. The reason why you don't want to, let's describe employee dependents, lump this information together is because an employee is likely to add or subtract dependents. So rather than executing a DDL statement, such as alter table quite frequently, store the information that is somewhat autonomous in a separate table. Employees' dependents are certainly legally owned by the employee, but they're also autonomous and they're also separate entities, and they're also subject to change. So as a result, they should be maintained independently. And the way you tie the pieces of information together, or you tie n number of dependents back to a given employee, since usually for tax purposes, at least within the United States, only one employee or working employee is permitted to claim a given dependent, is to simply list the ID, the employee's ID in some field, which could be called ID, but it made sense for us to give it a more descriptive name, such as emp underscore ID. So for any number of dependents, if the emp ID matches a given employee in the employee's base table, those dependents are dependents of the given employee. Let's show you what we mean. We're going to insert some data into the dependents table. So we'll insert into employee underscore dependents. And we're going to set values for each of these particular columns, but we could specify the individual columns or just go with values. Values works out nicely because it allows us to cut the amount of code necessary to get data in. So our values will be in between single quotes, and for this case we need five single quotes, although not all of the fields 
are required as you can see only the MPID field is required so we'll go ahead and specify all five and we're going to insert two dependents so for the first dependent the employee ID will set to one for the employee that we have to find. Now if it's easier to manipulate these statements within a text editor then by all means use a text editor and let's navigate to our gedit window where we'll doctor this up we'll set a new window and then once you have it modified here you can put it in after you do need to know the columns however so it's first name last name middle name so for first name let's go ahead and place amber and last name we'll place hyacinth followed by middle we'll place n and the very last field is social security which we'll specify as 000 000000 followed by a comma and we'll copy this entire block for values to define a separate user or a separate record since the insert statement will allow us to do this we're referencing yet again the same employee ID of one but simply changing the first name retaining the second and third names and changing the social security this time to nine ones super so now we can insert two records we certainly could have done this outside of an insert statement since this is subject to error we could have used a my sql import statement let's go ahead and reconnect using hr and attempting to insert this data two rows were inserted and no warnings were generated and no duplicates were realized let's go ahead and select star from employee dependents and let's show tables just to check our spelling we've screwed it up and there it is so let's select star from the proper table name dependence with an E although it can be spelled with an A now we have two records in and in order to join the user from the employee base table on these two dependents we'd need to construct a join we could use a left join or just simply a natural join or an inner join let's go ahead and pick from one of the joins that we've defined let's take for example the selection that you see here and alter it so that it returns the matches so we're gonna select ID the first name the last name we're not interested in salaries however we are interested in information coming out of the employee dependence table so we're gonna go ahead and call this one D dot F name comma D dot L name and let's just double check our structure and it's F name D L name so that works out pretty nicely from employees left join we change pay scale to employee dependents and again we spelled it incorrectly and we'll set this to be as D on employee dot ID equivalent to D dot emp underscore ID that should be a little cleaner let's attempt to execute and debug notice it worked out nicely so what's returned this time includes the following the employees name followed by the employees dependents first name last name and the employee comes up again followed by the employees dependents now we could have elected not to return any information from the left table but of course that wouldn't be useful unless you just wanted to see the dependents from the right table without selecting any information from the left table that's certainly possible so we could select only from the right table or the dependents table where the values are equivalent to what we want them to be so notice we removed any of the columns that we were interested in initially in the employees base table and selected only first name and last name after performing the join so these particular dependents 
are joined to the ID number one. Now we could have selected additional info such as DID or EID, that is E.ID, just so that we see the ID. And this tells us that one is the person who's responsible for these two dependents. So that's a little bit about tying using joins, tying information from one or more columns. Now for the syntax that we've shown you thus far, you can just simply replicate it to perform joins on multiple tables. So you can join many tables if your information spread across many tables. Thus far we've spread information across salaries as well as across employee dependents. We certainly could join all that information together if such a query were necessary.